military background, scientific perspective, legislative uh, post. So we really hope to engage in a rich discussion on these topics. Don't hesitate to use the chat function on Zoom to submit your questions uh, and comments, and we'll be, we'll be turning to those sort of quickly in the discussion. Um, now, it won't be lost on many of you that the title of this event um, is actually pulled directly from a pledge made by then candidate, now president-elect Biden, uh, made uh, actually quite early on in his campaign. Um, it was lost a bit because of the, the other, most of the attention on his climate plans were around emissions and mitigation, but actually the, the Biden campaign and then the, the Biden-Harris campaign was actually quite forward-looking and uh, quite ambitious, I would say, in, in thinking about climate security as well as climate change more broadly. So uh, his policy plans committed to uh, do exactly this, to elevate climate change as a core national security priority of his government. Um, his team also included a few specific commitments um, around orienting security briefings and intelligence assessments, as well as national security strategies uh, around and towards um, understanding climate change. So there was a lot of, of early promise um, already from the team that will likely make up the administration. We here at the Center for Climate and Security were, of course, uh, ecstatic and excited to see these commitments, in part because us and, and our team of advisory board members and experts um, behind the center have been calling for better integration and prioritization of the security threats posed by climate change for years. However, campaign commitments and high-level goals are one thing. Actually delivering on those ideas are an entirely another thing uh, uh, that, that one must do. So our goal with the discussion today is actually to help put some meat on the bones of, of these plans, talk about uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked in the past uh, to hopefully inspire with some innovative new thoughts and strategies as well. Um, and to, to really offer the wisdom of a group of leaders who has been there before, um, and hopefully some new energy as well of the people picking up the baton and, and going to carry this work forward within the Biden administration and of course outside of it as well. So last year, the Center for Climate and Security put out one version of a roadmap um, around how to do this, how to elevate climate security um, in, in the larger realm of national security priorities that the US takes on. This was the Climate Security Plan for America, and I believe we can put a, a link to that in the chat, and it was sent to most of you who RSVP'd for this. But it's a lengthy and quite detailed compilation of ideas and recommendations from close experts of, in each agency and, and the main offices tasked with this goal. Um, and it offers the president's team a whole of government approach to elevating and integrating climate risks across each agency. Now, I'll save you from reading the scores of detailed recommendations. I trust you've either already done so or can do so maybe over the, the end of your holidays. Um, but let me give an overview of the four main pillars that we think are most important to this plan. So the first is that the president's team and cabinet will need to demonstrate real leadership in this area. And this means going beyond rhetoric and actually implementing both in terms of personnel and in terms of strategic planning. Um, uh, bringing climate center to the security equation. So we've seen encouraging signs of this already, of course, with the appointment of John Kerry as presidential envoy with a seat on the National Security Council, and I'm sure we'll talk about that today. Um, but it's of the utmost importance that climate security is on the agenda of every appointee, uh, whether it's in their job description or more importantly, when it's not uh, in their title or, or they're not a quote unquote climate role. And beyond personnel, the administration can really hit the ground running, we believe, in the first 100 days by uh, tasking and orienting the federal government uh, to deliver a climate security strategy. So truly elevating this risk and putting it uh, in the center of all strategic planning efforts from the perspective of each agency. We'll spend most of the day really discussing this pillar and, and how to do that in the first few weeks in office or, or maybe the few weeks before they take office as well. Beyond that, the Climate Security Plan for America also recommends taking significant strides in how the federal government uh, assesses climate risk. So really using the full foresight capabilities of the government from the intelligence community to the scientific community um, and, and getting them working together better to predict and, and model where these risks might strike and what the security implications of those risks are. 
Um, third, we, we believe that this is not just something the US need do, but uh, truly the entire world needs to rise to the climate problem, but also the security elements of the climate problem. So it would be uh, uh, quite smart, we believe, of the United States to support our allies and partners uh, and, and really mobilize the world around the global issue of climate insecurity. And the good thing is we're seeing other countries really follow the lead of the United States. Um, they've been innovating on this for the past four years as well, uh, of integrating climate into their own military uh, preparedness planning, et cetera. So the time is ripe, we believe, for international cooperation on these issues as well. And finally, and, and perhaps the most important to really securing se to stability and, and livelihoods around the country are investing uh, much more talent and, and money and, and planning into building resilience at home. So that's resilience of our security infrastructure and institutions, but also resilience uh, beyond the fence line. Uh, so making sure that the, the DOD and, and uh, security actors are actually working hand in hand with communities to make sure that they are protected um, from the risks that are already coming online and we've seen across the country this year alone. So I'll stop there and again, excited to engage in, in each of these issues, particularly that first set around personnel and strategy. But let me uh, first pass it over to John Conger, who I'm sure all of you or, or most of you know, the director of the Center for Climate and Security, one of those experts that was there implementing on these ideas uh, from the beginning, um, uh, especially under the Obama administration, and has a few war stories of his own, and he'll introduce uh, our great panel for you. So thanks, and over to you, John. Thanks, Kate. Um, it is a true pleasure to be here today and to be uh, speaking to all of you. Um, we have an exceptional panel. Um, <clears throat> as, we, as we enter into uh, this uh, full tra full on transition period, and I know the transition has been going on for a little while, and we get ready for uh, the inauguration, and we get ready for the first hundred days where uh, a, a president really sort of sets the tone, sets the message, puts the plans in place, puts the personnel in place to, to execute on the next four years. Uh, I think that it is timely to be having this conversation to try and uh, sort of set the key things that need to happen at, at the beginning of the administration uh, and to get the ball rolling. I think one of the other things that um, we're gonna speak to the panel about is, is to get their perspectives on just what kind of a difference a leader who cares about an issue can make within the various federal agencies. This, you know, it matters a lot when the president cares about an issue and it matters to all of the people who work for him or her. But the fact of the matter is that how much the, uh, the appointed uh, leaders, at the, whether it's cabinet or sub-cabinet level, how much they care about an issue and how much they prioritize an issue and how much they understand the issue uh, matters too. And so we'll, we'll get into some of that detail today. Uh, let me now um, take a moment <clears throat> to introduce and provide the bios for our panel. I, um, you know, I, I, I prefer to read all the bios up front so that I, I'm not interrupting the flow of the conversation once we get to the panelists talking. Um, and so uh, I'm going to read their bios now, and then I'll, I'll hand the ball over uh, to, to our first one. So our first panelist is, is Sherry Goodman. Uh, Sherry uh, serves as the Secretary General of the International Military Council on Climate and Security, and here's the board of the, uh, of the Council on Strategic Risks. She's also a senior fellow at the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program and the Polar Institute. Uh, she was Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security, the first one ever, uh, uh, and a staff member on the Center Armed Services Committee, and has founded, led, or advised nearly a dozen research organizations on environmental and energy matters, national security, and public policy. And we like to say that, that she is the godmother of this issue. She really um, brought this forward as a, as a key issue. Uh, in the in Washington and in the in the federal space and uh, as climate and security intersected. Um, our second panelist is going to be Alice Hill. A Alice Hill is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's advisory board uh, and a member of the board of directors of the Council on Strategic Risks. Alice is also the senior fellow for climate change policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. She previously served as special assistant to the president and senior director for resilience policy on the National Security Council. 
uh, and uh, also previous to that as senior counselor to the Secretary of Homeland Security and as an ex officio member of the third National Climate Assessment. Um, our third panelist is uh, Dennis McGinn. Um, retired Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn is a member of the Center for Climate and Security Advisory Board and a senior member of the Executive Committee at the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Uh, he served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy Installations and Environment from September 2013 till January 2017. And previously, Admiral McGinn served on active duty in the, the U.S. Navy for 35 years including service as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Requirements and Programs and commanding the U.S. Third Fleet. Uh, Admiral McGinn is a former president of the American Council on Renewable Energy, uh, and he serves on the board of the Rocky Mountain Institute and the Electric Power Research Institute. Finally, we've got Mike Wu. Mike is a policy fellow with the Center for Climate and Security. He's also a principal at Converge Strategies and a fellow with the Resource Security Program at New America. Uh, Michael previously served as Senior Advisor on Energy Resilience and Clean Energy in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, and uh, previous to that, he founded the Defense Energy Program at the Truman National Security Project. Uh, Michael currently serves as an officer in the Judge Advocate General Corps of the U.S. Army Reserves. Uh, thanks to all of you. And with and that, I would like to hand it over to uh, Sherry Goodman for opening comments. Well, thank you very much, uh, both John and Kate, uh, for your excellent uh, remarks. Kate, that was really, really well done. And thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to join with my fellow panelists. Now, uh, it's not by accident I've situated myself uh, in the pseudo Arctic here. Uh, just to underscore for all of you, which uh, probably goes without saying that no region of the world is being changed more by climate change uh, than the polar regions, uh, the Arctic in particular, where temperatures are warming um, two to three times the rest of the planet. The sea ice is retreating, uh, the permafrost is thawing, and um, uh, the long-term ice is, is collapsing. So that just underscores in many ways the urgency of this issue as we have to prepare in a national security context now to address the consequences, the potential geopolitical consequences of climate change, changing the world around us in potentially increased competition in certain regions because of the climate security risks we now face. So uh, I want to underscore that the, um, you know, this climate security plan for America, which uh, so many worked so hard on, really provides a roadmap for um, how to elevate climate as a core national security priority. And it's, um, it's very heartwarming to see that much of the incoming Biden administration has already taken a lot of it to heart um, and has already begun to put it into practice. And as I reflect back on my experience when I came in at the beginning of the Clinton administration, ooh, okay, I won't say how many years ago that was, but you could do the math. Um, you know, we had uh, Al Gore as the vice president was certainly the champion of all things environmental in the Clinton-Gore administration. Um, we had nothing approaching the, um, the sophistication and a development of this climate security plan for America, even in the, in the, as it might be applied to environmental security at that time, we were focus more on cleaning up contamination from past, uh, from past industrial activities and conserving natural resources, sort of the first chapter, the first era uh, of this phase. And um, so I think back on how we, how we did we try to put um, the sort of will into practice, kind of where many of you are now, you, many of you are working already uh, and have been working at this for many, many years, yourselves in and out of government, and, and I want to thank you for all of that. I think this is an opportunity now to sort of up our game and, and re-energize and get a lot of things done that we've been working on uh, for many years. So I, I want to just reflect, tell a couple, a, a couple of short stories and then think about how we go through this using the Climate Security Plan for America really as a roadmap. And I hope that the incoming administration 
will do so and that those of you who are working on the Hill will use some of its elements as a, a way to ask good questions uh, when it comes to um, confirmation hearings for nominees. So I, I remember coming to the Department of Defense and yes, I had the environmental portfolio, but it didn't really necessarily mean that people at the secretary's, the secretary himself or the secretary was paying much regular attention to it, uh, except if it's a problem, okay? So one thing is where you have something, a problem or something has to get on the secretary's agenda because the White House calls a meeting, uh, there's a cabinet level activity. Um, and so there are, or there's a hearing. Um, so those are ways to think about how do you raise something up onto the agenda of uh, the, the secretary. And fortunately, you know, uh, Al Gore and the White House staff want to place this as a priority. So there were, there were matters uh, in the era related to environment and defense that did, did get on the secretary's agenda. And then we, we address those particular issues. Uh, I will say that it took though a few years before I could get the Secretary of Defense back at that time to actually give a whole speech on environment. Uh, and I hope it won't take that long this time because I, and in fact, I used hooks that were available to me like the hook of Earth Day. Earth Day is a big thing celebrated every, recognized every year by the Department of Defense as a way to recognize uh, the good work that's being done at, by people across, across our installations and installations themselves. And that was always a way to sort of get something on the agenda. So one year I wanted to advance recycling, which was still not happening in the Pentagon with recycled paper. And I couldn't get uh, Washington headquarters service. Some, some of you may even remember Doc Cook, the famous mayor of the Pentagon. I couldn't get him or, and his minions to agree to use recycled paper because they said it was maybe a half a cent more expensive at that time than um, white unrecycled paper. So I had tried many, many different ways, arguments, memos, you know, going up the chain. So finally I decided, okay, for the, sec for the Earth Day event this year with the Secretary of Defense, we're going to make it a recycling event. And uh, I got Doc Cook and his minions to you know, put together all the recycling bins and the accoutrements we needed to have an actual event that the secretary could do a little media play. And all of a sudden we had recycled paper and recycling bins around the Pentagon. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you use what the tools that are available to you. And um, I am, I'm hopeful we can, we, we can um, both take advantage of those, but also be very dedicated about it. Just when I think about DOD sort of, you know, we, we think about the parts of how the Department of Defense is organized. So, uh, you know, you've got four major undersecretaries. Well, now you have a fifth. Okay, let's say five major undersecretaries uh, of defense. So you've got, um, you know, one for people. Let's start with people or everything, right? Personnel. And so um, how we think about how we do personnel and readiness, how we do our people strategy should also reflect our climate security priorities. Uh, then you've got um, words, which is policy, words, okay? So obviously the strategy, a lot of what we talk about in there, we've gotta have a strategy, it's gotta be threaded throughout our strategy, plans, programs, policies, all the stuff that OSD policy does. Um, and then you have things, the acquisition, you know, that's where the offices of installation and environment traditionally have been, but how we buy our major weapon systems also very much reflects today our climate security and our low carbon. We have DOD is going to have to be able to lead by example as a one of the nation's largest energy users. That's going to be a very, a very big challenge. And then um, you've got money where it all comes down to uh, money. And we have a former uh, deputy comptroller here with John. So at the end of the day, as we say, strategy without resources is hallucination. So uh, the department's gonna have to figure out how to put all the departments, not just DOD, but the Intel community, which is also now a fifth undersecretary in DOD, um, is gonna have to figure out how to put um, money onto and resources against these priorities, particularly as we move towards um, low carbon options, but also to our resilience uh, and improving the resilience of our installations and the resilience of our infrastructure, 
which could also very well align with some of the early priorities of this administration to build back better uh, through green and clean infrastructure. So I'm very hopeful that uh, the national security community can play a very important constructive role, both as we address our domestic priorities in this way, but also very much on the global stage as we look towards um, being able to meet these targets of 2035 and 2050 for net, you know, for net zero, which we must meet to have any hope of bringing temperatures down. And then as we look uh, to a COP26 about a year from now that the national security community uh, in that major agreement can play an, a major role. And uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Alice? Sure, thank you. And thank you, John and Kate for organizing this. And I'm really honored to be uh, on this panel of uh, people who've devoted a lot of time and thought to how can we do better for planning and preparing for national security risks from climate change. So I uh, didn't start in this field. Uh, I essentially dropped into it. I was previously a judge so I had uh, had security experience, at least uh, through the criminal law and understanding how we uh, deal with events after the fact. But in 2009, I joined the Department of Homeland Security, the third largest department in the United States, uh, of course, born out of the events of 9-11. President Obama had just issued a, an executive order requiring all agencies to engage in adaptation planning. As I remember the events, I'm sitting around a conference table at DHS, uh, which is responsible for immigration and FEMA, Coast Guard, and they're looking at this order. Uh, no hands are going up. Climate change was politicized then, it still is now. So people looking around, they say, oh, give it to her, she's new. And that's how I ended up working on climate change. And I was the beneficiary of Sherry's work of, um, uh, the Navy's work, as we've heard about, and all the thought that had gone on to this issue before. But we asked ourselves at DHS, does this big, sprawling anti-terrorism department need to focus on climate change at this time? Probably a fairly insubordinate question as I look back on it. But we concluded then in 2009 that we needed to care deeply, that there were security risks posed to the homeland, as well as national security geopolitical risks posed by climate change. More than 10 years has elapsed since then. A lot of work was done in the Obama administration. I led the development of the order that President Obama signed on national security and climate change. President Trump then rescinded it. But we've lost a lot of time, honestly. Uh, we've seen uh, that are probably our greatest rival now, China, has taken advantage of the time. It's declared itself a near Arctic nation, uh, has already uh, proven that it can cross the uh, Arctic uh, Ocean. It uh, has indicated it has greater um, interest there than we would have thought. Uh, we are behind in our building of uh, icebreakers and we are uh, certainly not doing as much as China is to deal with flooding, which is a, one of our greatest risks right here at home in the United States. They're also building a global fishing fleet so that they are prepared uh, as fish move towards the polar regions, as we've heard from Sherry, as the in search of cooler waters. So we need to get serious. And uh, fortunately, a lot of people have put in great thought uh, and come together on this plan that has been described which sets forth an agenda. We can't wait for people like me to learn the issue when they get on the job. We need for people to be ready to go as soon as they get into this administration to turn their attention to national security risks posed by climate change. We are somewhat behind this issue in the United States, in my judgment, compared to others in understanding how this could affect what we have traditionally understood as national security if people lose access to fresh water, food, shelter, as they will with either acute events, storms, 
such as we saw just this uh, past month in Central America, which is now at least fueling greater migration and pressures immediately on our borders uh, in the South. Uh, or we've uh, seen other events, uh, extreme heat events across the globe, uh, drought uh, that will cause people to be on the move. The International Red Cross has estimated that by 2050, 200 million people a year will be displaced. And we have no current plan for what we'll do with those who are displaced that remain stateless. For example, those who are in a small island nation that simply disappears. So we need to get busy. And I have three pieces of advice based on my own experience uh, of landing in an, in an administration and trying to figure out how to make best use of my time during a limited stay as all political appointees have. And the first is be serious about a 100 day plan. I came to the department, uh, here's my career advice, be nice to those you sit next to in law school. I sat next to Janet Napolitano, who became the Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, and when I arrived, she asked me, what's your 100 day plan? And I had kind of a vague idea. My, of course, my plan was to be of assistance to her. But she said, no, really, what is the 100 day plan? And I learned from her leadership that it's critical you actually sit down and figure out what you're going to do during that time, and then build your plan from there going forward with identifiable goals. The second thing that I have for you advice is something that I learned when I worked in the White House and we were rolling out really on a weekly basis, different announcements about climate change. And it created a, generated a um, sense of momentum in the outside that the Obama administration was very active on climate. And what I learned uh, through some interagency meetings with uh, John was present is that a meeting is not an accomplishment. Once you get into the federal government, you will be invited to, in, in the political sphere, hundreds of meetings. Your day will be filled with meetings. Sometimes you can't figure out what the outcomes of the meetings are supposed to be. That, be. But no business gets done, in my experience, or very little without meetings. That's understood, but that's not an outcome. That you called a meeting is not an outcome, so you have to keep in mind at all times, what is the outcome I'm shooting for? What are the things? Is it an executive order? Is it uh, a new rollout of a policy? Whatever it is, if you don't have it in mind, it, it doesn't move. Um, and so uh, once I took that to heart, uh, and filled it into my 100-day plan. I began to see uh, great progress in, able, in ability to have myself and my team have identifiable uh, de deliverables or successes uh, during their time. And one thing I was very cognizant of, it's a limited tenure. So you've got to take advantage of it. Few people have this opportunity and you've got to have a plan to really make the most of it. And the third and final thing I would leave with you is something that I learned from John Barry, a very charismatic head of the Office of Personnel and Management. And I think this is just a, a basic management tool that I continue to use uh, now. It's, you need, you're gonna be, bomb, one is bombarded by the urgent. There are all sorts of things coming in. You need to do this, you need to do that. There's a crisis here. And that's particularly acute, I think in the political leadership within the federal government. The urgent is always overcoming the important. It's very difficult to get to something on your agenda that's important. And that's frankly, I think why we are behind on national security and climate change. It's a slow moving, distant feeling challenge. And there's so much that needs to get done right now that's perceived as much more urgent. But you have to have on your desk that list of what's important and what you're going to make sure you attend to. It's three to five different things that you're going to make sure that you attend to. And then those that worked with me, uh, my, uh, the, those that reported to me, I required they have their, their plans as well. And you make sure you're making progress on those plans because otherwise at the end of the day, we will have had a lot of meetings uh, and not as many results as we need. Of course, we're gonna have to have the meetings anyway, but we need to make sure we keep our eye on the ball. And that would be for this, we have a blueprint already that has been thought through of what are the major um, 
uh, levers that we need to move. Uh, and there's some very obvious ones for the uh, new team coming in, including bringing back some of the work that was previously done that uh, President Trump has rescinded, but also far broader than that and what needs to be accomplished. But we need leaders, as John has mentioned, who embrace this and take responsibility for it and actually drive it through. And it's not a small thing that's at stake. Our unwillingness to accept that we are already experiencing permanent changes in our environment that will have fundamental impacts to human security means that we are undermining our own security, even though we are the wealthiest nation in the world. And we need to think through what it means for our security, our homeland security, and our national security to experience extremes that have never been experienced in recorded history. The last worst event will not be the future worst event, and we need to make changes to how we do business, including our military installations, our preparedness for humanitarian events, our training, so that we are prepared. And we need the team that lands quickly and gets to business and follows through on an agenda, which has already, in essence, been prepared. So thanks for having me here today. Those are my nuggets for anyone who's going into uh, the federal uh, bureaucracy. There's a lot to be done. It's an exciting experience, but if you don't focus, uh, you could find that after whatever number of days there, you haven't accomplished what you had hoped from the beginning. Thanks, Alice. And I think it's really important to remember this is uh, dealing with climate change and national security is all in our own self-interest. This is not a selfless uh, exercise. This is something we're doing to protect ourselves. Uh, Denny, uh, you're up. You're muted. That is the, uh, the quotation of 2020, I think, is uh, you're muted. Uh, well, it's still, I'm still glad to be here with everybody, and now you can hear me. Um, you know, climate change uh, is so inherent to our national security. For many of you, you already get that, but not enough folks do at every level, especially in government. One of the things that we need to do coming straight out of the blocks of the Biden administration is make climate change inherent to literally every function of government. And this thoughtful approach has been taken in the climate security plan. So if you haven't uh, taken a look at it, get it, get it and, uh, and heed it. The other thing that is really, really important is to uh, understand the old adage, uh, what interests the boss fascinates me. And uh, our boss, our upcoming boss, Joe Biden and his team and all of, and they will all be bosses down the, the chain of uh, echelons. It should fascinate all of us because as John said, this is inherent to our national security. I'm gonna use a parallel that's been used uh, more and more over the past months, but how many of us not in the medical business, medical profession, even knew what this thing it was, an N95 mask a year ago. It was kind of like, what? I mean, that's kind of, yeah, I see those masks kind of over in, in Asia and, and other places, but you know, nothing really relevant to us. And all of a sudden, when the threat became clear to us on a personal level, on an organizational level, and then finally on a national level, uh, we started getting serious. And there was and there will be a lot of woulda, shoulda, couldas related to COVID-19 pandemic. We're coming out of it, getting better. But so many lessons. First one, listen to science. If science is telling you about a real threat that they have metrics for and they can define trend lines, listen and do something about it. Whether it's a mitigation of uh, threats to military installations, whether it's uh, what can we do to prevent the growing instability caused by the loss of basic human needs uh, overseas uh, with our allies and with regions of instability that already exist in the, in the world. 
So we have to make climate change a key part of literally every exercise of government responsibilities that we have, especially as it relates to national security. And that de definition of national security doesn't stop at the Pentagon. It is basically military, diplomatic, and economic aspects. Our energy security, our environmental security, and uh, our uh, economic security are inextricably linked. And we need to recognize that, that if we are to have national security, we've gotta be tending to all of those pillars uh, of, of energy, economy, and environment, especially environment. So back in the day, when I was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy working for Ray Mabus, Ray was interested in uh, getting more and more clean energy and energy efficiency. And it fascinated me that uh, we wanted to get more uh, renewable energy and, and uh, energy efficiency, and we did. We got over one gigawatt of uh, renewable energy in partnership with the uh, private sector, with utilities, with uh, local communities. And it, but that was only a start. We need to get out of the blocks very, very fast with this administration. And if somebody starts uh, arguing, well, you know, you can either have national security or economic security, and, and you know, you can be, uh, you can do something about climate change. Nah, -uh. it's not zero sum. It is very, very synergistic. It is a triple bottom line win when we the things that we do related to reducing the effects of climate change already underway by increasing the resilience of our forces and our bases and the things that we do to get more efficient and to choose alternative forms of energy that actually make us more mission effective. I think that is uh, absolutely key. No arguments uh, should be allowed about, well, we can do this or we can do, no, we've got to do it all. We can do it all because doing it all gives us a, a triple bottom line. One last po point, and I look forward to questions that may have. Um, you may have heard the old expression that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, we've got to make sure that in our warfighting culture, in our national security culture, that the danger, hit clear and present and growing danger of climate change is embedded right in our, uh, our culture. And as Alice said, when you, when you get up uh, and you, you start in your job, you got to make it a top priority, not just uh, listening or talking about it, but actually doing stuff, walking the walk and as you talk the talk. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and continuing this great conversation. Thanks, Danny. And I think that last point is really so important. This is not an either or question. It is not, is climate change a bigger issue or a more urgent security threat than China or Russia or whatever? It is, it is an and issue. It's how does climate change affect right. China and their threat? How does ch climate change affect Russian behavior in the Arctic? It is, it is integrated and it reshapes uh, all of the traditional threats we have. So we still pay attention to them and Thanks. climate change. And I'm going to go back on mute, John, with your permission. You bet. Um, Mike, you're up next. Yeah, thanks, John. And it's, um, I'll just echo Alice's thoughts about uh, what an honor it is to share this panel um, with folks who have shaped the sector that we're talking about and also um, to join so many participants. I, I saw the participant list of, um, you know, just a really close friends and family network within um, the energy, climate change, and national security community. John, you mentioned a little bit about leadership. You know, I had the, um, you know, great uh, privilege to serve a, a transformational leader who really cared about her people um, in the Pentagon, working for Miranda Ballantyne, who was the former Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Installations, Environment, and Energy. And one of the things that she walked in doing was um, thinking that she was really going to focus on um, clean energy within the Air Force. And one of the things that she learned, I think very early on was the question is about how to strengthen military capabilities and resilience for the service and use clean energy as a tool to achieve some of those goals and ends. And I think that really colors, has certainly colored my um, approach and impression um, for how to approach this, particularly just within the Department of Defense. So if you think about some of the Biden-Harris um, campaign commitments around climate change and clean energy, they're incredibly aggressive. 
two trillion dollar climate plan, three hundred billion dollars dedicated to research and development with a strong focus on clean energy and American manufacturing. I think uh, the Department of Defense needs to be an essential partner in executing those commitments, um, but it needs to come from a focus around how do you strengthen military capabilities and resilience? How do our military forces better prepare um, for the strategic environment they'll face in the future and, in, and, and at home as well? Um, you know, Admiral McGinn has certainly um, plunged into this and, and led a lot of uh, groundbreaking work on that sector. But I, I just wonder um, to take a couple seconds on what I see as near-term opportunities for a clean energy agenda for the Department of Defense. So the first really starts with our domestic bases um, where you know, we are both under threat from climate and under threat from determined adversaries, including in particular um, from a cybersecurity perspective as we've seen, um, you know, we have a, 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 a ton of important assets that are on our domestic bases and that are critical to executing key national security missions. And um, most of them are linked to the same civilian electric grid uh, that we are all, that, that is powering um, all of our homes today. Um, and we have inadequate resilience um, capabilities and provisions for those key national security assets today. Um, and that's gotta change. Um, so, you know, I would really look at the kind of investment and resources that John, you mentioned that uh, could be directed toward uh, the Department of Defense and toward a clean energy agenda. And really starting and looking at um, our DOD installations here at home and thinking about A, how are we going to have a uh, clean energy, American-made clean energy supply chain? Um, we uh, previously uh, used the Defense Production Act uh, for things like renewable fuels. Obviously, they've been critical to the pandemic. We need to think about, you know, what's going to what it's going to take to have uh, energy storage and clean energy systems on, um, that can power those critical assets and provide the resilience that we currently lack on DOD critical assets. Um, B, we should be looking at the Department of Energy. Um, and uh, a lot of us have uh, experienced the challenges of working in the interagency and working between the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, and a lot of the other stakeholders. But it has to be a collaborative environment um, where uh, you know, we're using key technical capabilities at the Department of Energy that don't currently exist at the Department of Defense um, to accelerate assessments, to accelerate uh, the development of long duration energy storage technologies, um, to accelerate uh, the efficiency of clean energy generation um, and the security of our control systems. Those are key gaps today, I think, that we need to urgently address. And then finally, it works, um, we have to deploy government resources, but in public-private partnerships to scale these systems um, to meet some of the, uh, the to meet the scale of the challenges that we that confront us today um, around resilience. And I think the last thing I would say is that doesn't stop obviously at domestic installations. Um, a lot of the things that um, folks on this call and uh, on this webinar uh, had had started around. Uh, changing the weapon systems and platforms um, and changing the way we power our military powers those weapon systems and platforms um, have somewhat stagnated in the last four years. You know, I think about the Navy's hybrid drive um, ship program uh, that has been discontinued, or I think about, um, you know, some of the, um, you know, d dismounted soldier and Marine power um, that has um, sort of been discontinued. We should be thinking about a couple things. Number one is we should be thinking about how um, clean energy can power the tactical edge. That involve that that uh, involves both, you know, our troops in forward operating bases, um, our ships and aircraft, um, and other clean energy technologies that can be used to change our military force structure. And the second is we should be thinking about transforming flight. There's an opportunity in front of us. Military 
uh, jet fuel is by far the biggest driver of our military energy budget, we should be thinking about how that um, how we can gain efficiencies through uh, partnering with civilian airliners and FedEx and UPS and other folks who are really focused on this issue to think about fundamentally redesigning um, air travel and air transportation for uh, ways in which we could gain military capability, but also hopefully um, really catalyze uh, civilian military technology crossover so that um, you know, we can transform the way we travel and the way we, um, and the way we transport goods and services today. Thanks, Mike. I think that, that um, just to, to foot stomp that last point, um, the preponderance of DOD emissions comes from aircraft and particularly uh, wide body aircraft. And until we revolutionize, uh, you know, air travel and, and aircraft engines and so on, um, we're, we're not going to be able to make as big a dent as we want in the, the Department of Defense's emissions. Um, so first, let me just say thank you to all of our panelists for your initial comments. I have a, a few questions that I had planned and a few that have come in from the audience. Um, I think I'd like to start uh, with the beginning of the Climate Security Plan for America, where we call on the next administration to uh, appoint a standard bearer, to pick somebody to be the climate security expert in, uh, in the White House and to have uh, direct access to the president. Uh, the, the Biden administration, or the vice, uh, President-elect Biden has appointed uh, Secretary Kerry to be a climate envoy with direct access to the president and a seat on the NSC. Um, can, can, can you all uh, comment on how important that is and what he will need to be able to do in order to make the, uh, the difference we want to see? Well, I, I can start uh, since I uh, served on the National Security Council staff. I think this is highly significant. It um, makes clear that Climate change is a national security risk. There would be no other reason for him uh, to be on the a National Security Council. It also um, will allow him to leverage his um, deep uh, foreign policy experience and his many relationships around the world as he pursues the climate agenda internationally, um, globally. Uh, he also comes uh, with deep relationships with many of those who've already been named as part of the cabinet or the White House staff. So I think he will be able to hit the ground running. He is also, thirdly, a longtime champion of uh, greater action on national security and climate change. When we were developing the executive order uh, for President Obama, uh, the State Department team under his leadership said, uh, we want to do the same thing in the State Department right now. So uh, rather than wait for our process to go through, I've talked a little bit about all the meetings that you have to get through to get something done. Um, he just ordered uh, that the State Department stand up a group focused on national security and climate change. So he will hit uh, the ground running. He doesn't need any education and I'm very confident he'll have a hundred day plan and more uh, already uh, ready to roll and his team will be able to make a significant difference. One of the things I observed when I was on the National Security Council staff is that in many meetings, climate change didn't deserve or didn't, didn't merit uh, a, a mention by those who were uh, responsible for these issues. And in fact, over time, it was my concern that climate change never seemed to make it onto the agenda that began to drive the uh, desire to make sure that there was a mechanism to ensure consideration of the issue. I think that uh, John Kerry being present will make sure that we don't have a discussion of Pakistan that lacks uh, any understanding that it's very vulnerable to um, major natural hazards and that could undermine uh, some of our strategic interests there by way of example. So it's 
good news uh, for those of us who are concerned that the United States has been uh, somewhat slow to recognize the security risks posed by climate change. Yeah, let me just underscore what Alice uh, said. You're, you're right on, Alice, in, in all of what you relate. And also thank Mike and, and Denny also for your comments, excellent comments. And also, uh, Mike, you're really uh, uh, right there at the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the tactical edge now where, where we're leading. Um, and Denny, with your uh, terrific experience. Um, yeah, I served on uh, Secretary Kerry's International Security Advisory Board when uh, he was Secretary of State. And that board reported to the undersecretary for, um, uh, I think it's called non-proliferation and arms control. It was Rose Gottmiller at the time. Usually it had the, it was the hard security portfolio for the State Department. Um, and he made sure, as did Rose, that, um, you know, we integrated climate security into a number of studies we did from one on the Arctic uh, to another on energy security. Um, even when we were, and when Kerry came to address our board, he always wanted to talk about climate change and oceans uh, because those were his really big passions. And so I think he's going to carry that through uh, to his seat on the uh, National Security Council and, and not be afraid to ask questions, uh, meaningful questions, when in the early phases of administration, they're doing a you know, regional strategy, strategy for China, strategy for Russia, you know, regional strategies around the world. What are the climate dimensions of those strategies? And then how, what roles should different agencies play? Um, and he also at state was very determined to integrate uh, climate change and climate security into all of the foreign policy planning processes and stood up a dedicated effort to do that. Um, you know, he invited uh, the CNA Military Advisory Board, myself and Amber Lee Dunn and a few others to come and brief uh, a number of his uh, staff on that and I'm sure he had others as well um, so that he could advance this thinking throughout the State Department. So I, I would expect him to want to, to uh, will urge that not only for the State Department but for other um, agencies as well, which I think over the long term can make a big difference. And that also has to extend to um, education and training. Uh, because that really hits at um, both current serving officials, uh, officers, enlisted civilians, but also at the at the next generation. And many of you serving now, I think, you know, we we hammered this hard in my um, eight years. We tried to integrate environmental security into professional military education. I'd say we made at best some small dent, but left a lot to be. A uh, lot, lot more to be done, and I'd say the same is true today where we are uh, in climate security, education, and training. John, uh, if I could make a, a comment, uh, it, I fully endorse the comments by uh, Alice and Sherry about Secretary Kerry. I've had the opportunity to uh, work with him, uh, not directly, but alongside as, as partners in various endeavors. We flew down to uh, Norfolk together uh, when he was Secretary of State uh, to the Atlantic Command, and it was all focused on climate change and national security, and that was way back when. In 2010, he was one of the leaders in the Senate on uh, trying to push forward for a viable uh, climate legislation, so he will be terrific. I wanted, though, to mention one of the things that our climate security plan needs to really emphasize throughout the government is the power of the government to buy. We have huge federal budgets. Uh, obviously, DOD has one of the largest. And we can use that power of the purse to be a market leader, uh, whether it's uh, not just developing things for ourselves in military or DOD labs, but rather uh, to do that where it's appropriate to the mission. But also, public-private partnerships can do so much to increase uh, resilience, uh, renewable energy, other great uh, initiatives on installations literally around the world. So I think that uh, using the power of the purse, the power to scale at, uh, to very, very efficient uh, ways, similar to uh, what Mike was talking about uh, related to uh, aviation fuels, just one example, but there are many others. And John, briefly, um, so one of the things that Admiral McGinn mentioned in his opening remarks that I think is really important to flag is, 
you know, you want to care what your boss cares about. Um, but you really don't want to step over any red lines that your boss might have. And um, a lot of bosses in this administration, I think, explicitly considered um, climate change as a red line that they didn't want to um, deal with or really consider. And a lot of the folks, including some who I know are on this call, have been doing incredible work, but keeping it extremely um, close hold or you know, framing it in different terms than on climate change and national security positions. And one of the real values, um, I think, is taking down some of those artificial distinctions. Climate change, we know as a national security issue, um, is unique um, in, in how transcendent it is, in how it affects all other issues, in that it's a threat multiplier, as Sherry um, coined the term many years ago. And, uh, and I think that you know, that's really hard to grapple with when you are explicitly barred or implicitly barred from considering it as a phenomenon or as a term. And so the uh, opportunity in front of the incoming administration is to really hopefully normalize and um, allow for um, the, the actual, for reality um, to be considered in our national security Decision making. I think that's a tremendous, and I think I think Secretary Kerry's appointment is a tremendous first step in that because um, the National Security Council is obviously where we consider those interagency challenges to national security. So, so uh, based on that, let's take it one step further. We have uh, Secretary Kerry in the White House. He's got a seat on the National Security Council. Um, there's a requirement to have a national security strategy within a certain number of days of a new administration. Um, the Climate Security Plan for America calls for a whole of government climate security plan that obviously includes state and defense and, and much more. Um, we've made a lot of progress in the Defense Department space in the last few years uh, with the help of, and support of Congress, but also from the, uh, from, from the building. Uh, how about how do you how do you see this all wrapping together? How can we maximize success uh, looking at state and USAID and Homeland Security and bringing those partners into this conversation more wholeheartedly uh, in an initial set of planning? Um, so let me let me pose that and see if anybody has any comments there. Well, I, I do think thanks thanks John. I think we have to go back. Uh, to, to the era where we were trying better to integrate um, diplomacy, development, and defense, the three Ds, but in a broader whole of government context in a way that directly integrates climate security considerations or what um, I'm starting to call the climatization of security, climatization of security. Um, I think that this, we have an opportunity now to, to address our whole national security and international security strategies in a way that fully reflects um, climate security considerations and does so in a way recognizing um, that the solutions to the climate challenge are often not in the mil military sphere. DOD can certainly lead by example um, in low carbon energy futures and in resilience and in supply chains and in technology in many, many other ways, and we should we should count up and, and, and do those ways. But the whole of government effort, you know, is going to require development um, and diplomacy, renewed effort on on diplomacy, uh, also many many other tools at our disposal, investments, private sector resources, uh, stakeholders of a variety of types, um, and recognizing also. Um, indigenous and native and a variety of diverse uh, multicultural populations that need to be included in a very broad scale kind of whole of society effort uh, to reflect how, how we're going to uh, be able to uh, build back better in a both domestic and international way. One of the things that uh, we can do in the military sphere is in working with our partners uh, overseas, help them to benefit from our experiences in increasing our resilience. I can envision uh, platoons of Navy CBs and Army engineers working with uh, 
with uh, host nations to on projects that actually increase the resilience uh, of the, uh, the, the sea coasts, et cetera. We're not talking mega projects necessarily, but just having the conversation centered around what can we do collectively to be more resilient in the face of all the severe weather events that we are already experiencing and will even more as, uh, as the planet uh, warms up. But I think that uh, it's almost a, it's a, it is literally non-lethal use of our military for a very, very uh, important national security purpose, w working with allies and partners overseas. I would uh, add, I, I think, uh, uh, wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said. I would note that the new team uh, will have one advantage uh, here, uh, one executive order that is still standing. Uh, I uh, led the development of it. It was to screen all of our international um, development work for climate resilience. So uh, USAID uh, currently, as far as I know, does still screen uh, to make sure that that mosquito malaria project is resilient to whatever the change in the geographic zone will be, or if they're building a road or the Millennial Challenge Corporation for its major investments. But much more needs to be done. We don't have that occurring uh, across the board. And I think that we are in a position to lend assistance to help people stay at home. I'll just remind you of what um, Bob Gates did. He uh, advocated when he was Secretary of Defense for more money for aid uh, to help countries. Uh, and that was not, uh, it was in our self-interest as Denny and, and John have alluded to, this was a national security. And when Jim Mattis, uh, President Trump's first Secretary of Defense was asked about it, um, he said, uh, yeah, we need to invest in uh, overseas. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'll need to just buy more bullets. And that's really what we're talking about here is helping other countries and other people thrive so that they're not on the move and so that their, their own governments don't crumble in the face of unprecedented events, which they simply are not well suited or prepared to handle given their, the other stresses they face. So there is some good news, some things are already in the works, but there's a lot more to be done as everyone has pointed out. And it requires a whole of government really understanding that climate affects everything as uh, Michael has said. I, thanks, Alice. I would just add um, briefly, just in a flag issue that I, I, I don't know that, um, you know, a tremendous number of people are tracking right now is you know, in concert with the really aggressive investments in um, clean energy and American manufacturing and climate change that the Biden plan identifies, um, there's also some pretty aggressive commitments to, um, to uh, buy America and to standing up, um, well, to ensuring that purchases, for instance, from the federal government are focused on American made materials, goods, products. And, um, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of people about this and I think that um, that's gonna be a challenge because we currently today, um, I don't think have a clean energy sector that is prepared to scale the amount of production and manufacturing um, that is commensurate with the um, investments and commitments that the incoming administration it, uh, things are necessary and frankly are necessary. And so, you know, that's going to be a really important challenge that we shouldn't lose is that we're going to need to scale um, American clean energy manufacturing. Um, at the same time, we're scaling American clean energy deployment, um, which is both a security issue, an economic security issue, and a national security issue, as, as, as Emma McGinn mentioned as well. So, so we've had some uh, tremendous number of questions uh, on really good topics. I'm going to try and cluster a couple of them together um, and, and see if um, I can hit uh, multiple questions at the same time. So, so there's a group of questions talking about the UN Security Council. We just have, we have a new uh, nominee for a UN ambassador. Uh, what are the signals that we expect from her 
uh, she goes to the UN and talks, engages the, the Security Council as far as uh, American posture on climate security, what kinds of climate change topics need to happen within the, the UN Security Council, that, that kind of thing. Did, did anybody want to take that? Um, uh, I've got a whole other set of questions on new executive orders, and, and then I want to start talking about uh, clean energy technologies because we've got a bunch of questions on that as well. So, uh, but the UN stuff first. Okay, I think Josh asked that question. Good question, Josh uh, Busby on the, um, and you've done great work. So thank you for all you continue to do in this area. You know, I, I hope that as the US gets back into the climate game and in the UN forums, um, we'll play uh, a more meaning, well, we haven't played any role in the climate security mechanism at the UN to date um, in the last few years, but now we, we can, and I think uh, my, my hope is that enables us to um, uh, build on the good work that's already been done uh, by the, the countries that have been active in it um, and also enable it to, to uh, reflect all the elements of what we've been talking about, um, the integrated sense of development, diplomacy, uh, defense, and the others, and that we, we sometimes it has a sense of being focused on the overly secure the concern about securitization of climate, and I would flip it around to climatization of security considerations in a UN context. In other words, whether it's um, you know the UN peacekeepers out on a mission, what what's what are the root causes of those missions that they're out there for, um, and reflected more broadly throughout the UN's work, both in. Uh, the UN Development Program and, and the Environmental Program and the many parts of the UN that are often have meaningful work but are uh, discon but somewhat disconnected in their own silos, uh, just like any large bureaucracy. And just if I, I, I know Josh had another question about um, the Global Fragility Act and um, there already is a, a very active interagency a working group um, led by a very talented um, professional at DOD, Annalise Blum, and many others in the interagency process called Recess, um, a Resource Competition, Environmental Security and Stability to integrate environmental security, think climate security as well, uh, considerations into the Global Fragility Act, which I think was the initial momentum to get that group started, but I think it could have potential legs uh, to lead us into um, the new administration and be a broad-based group to work within uh, policy and its counterparts in other agencies better to integrate these considerations across the uh, strategy and planning enterprises. Great, uh, thanks. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about, you know, as we walk into the first 100 days or even shorter, there's a bunch of executive orders that have been promised. There have been executive orders promising um, that uh, new investments aren't gonna have the same carbon impact or that they're gonna have more resilience uh, and so on and so forth. What, what are we expecting? What do we, uh, what do we think we really need as far as uh, key topics for new executive orders right at the outset of the administration in order to shape what we do going forward? John, I'm sure that the transition team is reviewing every executive order that has been issued over the last four years. And uh, they probably put them in categories of, okay, let's keep that one, makes sense, it's helpful. There are others that uh, are gonna be immediately, let's throw that one away. That's a, a red alert. And some that are gonna be in the, uh, in the corral that says, we need to figure out whether we wanna do something about this with a new uh, legislative initiative or a new executive order. But I know that that process is going on now in the transition team, but that executive orders as the, uh, the team is, uh, is forming up are gonna be the, one of the main tools in the toolbox. And uh, I would target those things which over the past four years have not been helpful to uh, increasing our national security in the face of uh, growing climate change. All right. <clears throat> Great. I, no, and I think the promises are out there. I mean, if you look through the, the president-elect's plans, there are, uh, there are uh, any number of on day one types of things for executive orders. I think that 
from from our perspective, uh, and a lot of this is on day one, what we need to do is make sure that we have a strategy in place and a, um, a list of concrete act and measurable actions uh, for those first hundred days that we'll be able to measure against for the next four years. So, you know, we won't pretend we have all the answers right now or that they have all the answers right now, but they have to develop the list of things to do early on. And so there's going to be some urgency, Alice, as you pointed out. Um, in that first hundred days, you need to you need to be able to set that list up. I've had uh, a lot of questions in the chat about um, you know clean energy and on emissions and on the roles that the that uh, procurement might play in this space. Um, traditionally, um, the the Center for Climate and Security doesn't necessarily get into the energy policy, right? Although we have energy policy experts on this panel and, and you can certainly opine if you choose. The security has been our, our, our framework uh, largely. And I will, um, and we'll put it in the chat, I will reference, we did put, to, put out a report in February called the Security Threat Assessment of uh, Global Climate Change that, that essentially said, um, what is the security threat and what is the security risk if we keep going up in global temperature, if we get to two degrees, if we go to four degrees increases, what are the security threats associated with that? So we put our security uh, hat on looking at these future scenarios. Um, and there it is. Um, so, so in that context, um, can we talk a little bit about, and that report concluded, we needed to do something to uh, reduce emissions globally not DOD, not just the US, but everybody. Um, it, I'm, I want, I've gotten enough questions on this in the chat that I wanna open it up to, what do we think that the new administration needs to do uh, from that perspective to, to tackle that problem? I know there's any number of things, but uh, I wanted to let you all comment. John, uh, one thing I would uh, start with is uh, that partnership with the private sector. The new administration really, really needs to be tuned in to what is happening in the uh, innovative energy technologies, whether it's related to energy efficiency or whether it's uh, new energy generation, the electrification of things which currently rely on fossil fuel but can be converted with a very strong business case to, uh, to electricity. Uh, uh, I know one of the initiatives that, uh, that I'm aware of is called the Low Carbon Resource Initiative. That's being led by the Electric Power Research Institute, which consists of every kind of uh, utility company, not just in the US, but, but around the world. So the, it being informed by the private sector and uh, adding uh, an amplification whether it's on procurement or awareness or whatever, it really, really will help. One other point uh, quickly, there's a lot of, lot of interest in hydrogen. Uh, that is in the production of green hydrogen, how you can store it, how you can transport it, how you can use it to convert it into electricity or heat or whatever. And I think that's going on in, in Europe. It's going on big time in, uh, in Asia, especially in Japan and starting uh, now in, uh, in North, North America. So those are a couple areas that, uh, that would lend themselves to uh, federal uh, procurement, federal interest, federal partnership. I would uh, agree with everything Danny said. Actually, we have to um, cut our emissions. Uh, this is, we have to avoid the very worst of climate change. Uh, what we're talking about with national security and climate change, of course, is um, managing the unavoidable. One thing that we haven't really, we've been talking about this as if they're two sides of the coin, which they are, uh, cutting emissions and adaptation or uh, preparing for the impacts. But when you start talking about how we're gonna cut our emissions, we need to also start talking about what it means for adaptation. And I'll just give you one example, which I think that uh, we need to look at all of our power generation in terms of adapting to these new events. One uh, area of consideration is nuclear. And one of the cheapest ways to uh, get nuclear power is to extend the licenses of the nuclear plants that we've had, many of them which were built in the 70s and 80s, when climate change was just not a consideration at that time. They were not planned uh, or constructed or operated with climate change in mind. But we have no governance structure right now to determine whether an extension should be granted. 
Uh, is that facility that's in along the coastline at greater risk uh, going forward? Uh, is it at greater wildfire risk? We saw wildfire approach San Onofre uh, in California. Uh, we've seen a, a plant in Connecticut shut down because the cooling waters uh, got too warm. We need to make sure that as we drive towards greater mitigation of emissions, we're also calculating what it means to have worsening impacts. Right now, these two fields are treated very separately. Actually, the experts are generally very separate from each other. National security may be one place it's joined, but there are two kind of groups going here. And if unless we can marry consideration, we are at risk of creating more harm for ourselves. Um, so there, there are other examples of this, uh, but nuclear is probably the most acute since we haven't figured out yet what should be required before we say you can have a license extension on that facility here in the United States or somewhere else in the world where there may not be as strong uh, governance as we have here. Jerry, did you have something you wanted to add? I wanted to give uh, I want to give Kate a chance to comment uh, since she's the principal author of the security threat assessment report and she has so much uh, to to contribute. Absolutely, Kate. Did you want to add some some thoughts? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a lot of it has been said, but if you if you go and read that report, which if the climate security plan for America is is what to do about it, the security threat assessment is what happens if we don't do anything about this? Um, and it, it really, from a security perspective, looks at two scenarios of warming, one in which we constrain our emissions globally and one in which we don't. And uh, I guess uh, to ruin the moral of the story for you, both are really bad, but the, the scenario in which we don't do anything is completely catastrophic from a security perspective. And so, I think what's important when when you look at a report like that is is one we actually need the federal government doing that type of assessment much more regularly. We need to know sort of what as to, to Alice's point what these impacts as they sort of come online much much of which is already sort of baked into the world for the next 10, 20, 30 years where US interests and especially where sort of global security interests are going to be impacted and when we've briefed the, the findings of this report to the Pentagon, to the uh, sort of national intelligence community, et cetera, uh, what they say is that we, we need these analyses sort of in every strategic planning process. Otherwise, we're flying blind to uh, the sorts of changes that are going to be sort of coming online already. Now, in that longer term scenario, I think what, what is uh, abundantly clear is that it is a national security priority to make uh, the transition to net zero to make rapid emissions cuts from a security perspective to avoid that scenario. And I think that is something that the security community is increasingly able to discuss and able to say from a, a perspective that, you know, they didn't often get involved in mitigation conversations <laughs> before this. But if you look at from a, a, you know, threat assessment perspective, that that security uh, scenario is so intense and so catastrophic and so terrible, we need to do everything we can uh, from the front end to avoid it. Uh, I think the last thing that I'll say, and it's something that hasn't really come up yet in the conversation, is that there are huge geopolitical uh, repercussions for these changes that are happening. Uh, you can see a little bit of that in the threat assessment report. But as we said, the Biden administration will need to take into account both the climate impacts as well as the impacts of the energy transition on the sort of global geopolitical stage and how our adversaries are going to start taking advantage of these impacts um, uh, as they, they hit uh, our own military and our interests around the world. Uh, the Arctic is a big region to, to look at that, but it's not the only one, right? Think about the Antarctic on, on the other side of the world or uh, across the Pacific and across uh, Central America and of course the Middle East. Um, so if we have a situation where the ground is really shifting under the feet of all of the security priorities we have at, at present, we need to know how and where and exactly in what way those impacts are going to start striking if we're going to know what to do about them. So Mike, you were trying to get in earlier. I want to give you a chance to, to, to comment. It might be on a question of uh, one, one question ago, but still. I know, I think it's actually, Kate, I think laid out exactly the right um, foundation for the point that I wanted to make, which is, you know, Kate, Kate's report, which is an amazing report, really lays out how complicated, difficult, and challenging our global security environment 
is going to become, even if we take serious climate action, but obviously um, much worse if we don't take serious climate action. And I think one of the things that we, one of the traps we come into as a national security community is thinking about, um, or particularly within DOD, is thinking about um, decarbonization and strengthening military capabilities as um, something as mutually exclusive objectives, or at least as separate objectives. And I think they're inextricably intertwined. That we that in a in a more difficult security environment where we're going to have um, more challenges maintaining the tail of logistics that currently exists and the ways in which we approach that, um, it's going to be um, incumbent on us to become uh, to to use clean energy as a tool uh, to change the way we power that force so that it can stay on station longer, so that we can project power differently, um, so that we can accomplish an increasingly um, changing mission set and have that flexibility within our force structure. Um, and so specifically, how do we do that? Um, you know, Sherry, many uh, uh, in the Clinton administration stood up a program that still exists today called the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. It's the DOD's energy and water technology test bed program. It's been incredibly successful. It can be scaled up. Um, we, um, one of the key challenges that ESTCP has experienced is that do a great job of validating emerging technologies for use but then part of their mission set is transitioning those across the DOD enterprise, um, but it's not resourced to do that. Um, so uh, we should be looking at ESTCP at creating a climate and energy transition fund to take validated technologies um, and transition them across the DOD enterprise. Um, we should do that on the operational energy side as well. We should look at um, operational energy technologies that are like that, as Admiral McGinn pointed out, have business cases today, but don't have a pot of resources or funds to actually fund their use. Um, I, I think about my experience, particularly within the Air Force, you know, we have some of the most inefficient um, aircraft platforms today. Um, there are many commercial off the shelf technologies that could be retrofitted on those aircraft winglets, um, in addition to many sort of transformative technologies that we could be investing in, but we don't have the funds today to, or the programs today to um, transition those as a regular part of our doing business. Um, so, you know, there's an operational energy capability improvement fund. We should think about a parallel operational energy capability transition fund um, that can help um, just both change today's force but really think about how we invest in breakthrough technologies for tomorrow's force uh, to confront the global strategic environment that Kate pointed out um, is going to be increasingly fraught. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great okay. point. Can I, can I add on that? I, thank you, Mike, so much. Um, I, I do think there's so much room um, for, for growth to meet the administration's climate ambition goals through better investments in uh, DOD as, as well as other agencies in an ambitious Manhattan style like um, decarbonization effort and clean energy technology. But it does matter how you spend the money um, because the challenge with the ESTCP 64 DEMVAL program, as you pointed out, is that um, the bases, the commands are not required to uptake the technology and they're often not required, there are no requirements in DOD to do so. So it just, unlike a weapon system, which has a full, um, you know, development, RDT and e development chain. So that's where I think a transition fund, which would, I agree with it, could be attractive. Um, and we need to enable um, the services and other components to compete for that. Uh, with specific objectives in mind, uh, geared towards the goals of the administration, and uh, then they get re get rewarded for that. Uh, I think that could be a very powerful um, incentivizing tool to enable DOD to lead by example. And we have to very carefully specify what those targets are. So Sherry, Mike, when you guys start talking about money, it's like sweet music to me because, uh, you know, everything is... Uh, 
you know, I hate to say that everything can be solved by more money, but it sure helps. Um, the, uh, the, now, as we think about the new administration coming in, they're going to have to uh, edit a uh, budget request in short order. Typically, a new administration submits their new budget in April or May, uh, taking whatever that was the draft version that gets handed over to them. Um, they're also going to have a, probably, hopefully, an appropriation measure here passed soon that they'll have the ability to do some reprogramming uh, within if they had priorities to on things to spend within the, these next uh, several months. What, what do we anticipate are the highest priority shifts? If you're looking at it from a climate perspective, um, where is the money going to move or is it not going to move? Is this not a money question really? Uh, and it's just a matter of how you use the money you already have? Or are there significant, you know, Mike, you already gave a couple ideas, significant uh, new investments that needs to be made uh, in a particular area if they really wanted to uh, make, make an impact? Where do we think that, that that's going to happen? John, one of the areas uh, having, you know, served along with you in the installations business is uh, there needs to be more money. Uh, put uh, into our installation resiliency. Uh, we can cite over the past uh, three to four years a terrible, terrible uh, damage that's been done to installations across the country, whether it's off at Air Force Base due to floods in the Middle East, uh, in the middle part of the country or Midwest, or uh, Gulf Coast, Tyndall Air Force Base, Atlantic Coast, uh, uh, Marine Corps, uh, Camp Lejeune. So I think that uh, getting more resilience there a policy aspect that will cause a lot of people to pay a lot more attention to resilience is if we mandate that the base realignment and closing commission consider resilience of the installation in making its decisions about uh, which, which bases get closed or which ones uh, get uh, aligned. Because why keep bases going that we know within the next five, 10, 15 years are gonna be wiped out because yet another Atlantic uh, or Gulf Coast uh, hurricane. So I think making uh, climate resilience a part, a key parameter for the BRAC process is another one. Oh, that's a, that's a really challenging one. Uh, I, and, I, um, <laughs> well, it'll get, it'll get everybody's attention because look at the attention that uh, BRAC gets up on the hill. And if uh, people are saying, well, why would we even consider closing that? Well, here's why. We just spent uh, three and a half billion dollars on Camp Lejeune over the past, uh, after the past two hurricane seasons, or we've essentially had to build, rebuild Tyndall from the ground up and uh, the opportunity costs for those kinds of things. But getting it into the BRAC process gets it in, gets the attention of, uh, of the congressional delegations from the various states. And I think right. that could so be it's a good thing. Lead, what it'll lead us to do then is to uh, climate proof and make resilient at great cost, as we've already seen, bases that in a more rational right. process, the services would come up yeah. with decisions about where, where, how to right size yeah. the mission. Sure. And instead, the, because we don't have a BRAC, uh, law right now, base closure law, um, you know, the, the constituent politics will necessarily drive sure. it. Good for any one particular local community, the base and the jobs around there, but may not be good for um, what the Department of Defense needs overall. Yeah, that, that's it's, a, it, it's a classic uh, pay me now, pay me later proposition. You're going to pay me now to make it more resilient, you're going to pay me later to repair repair it because it wasn't resilient. So, so in fairness, there I mean, is no background authorized, right? You know, we all understand that there's not currently one pending. But I do think you, back to John's question, you know, one of the areas I think that uh, DOD can help lead by example is in, in electrification of vehicles. Yeah. Uh, it buys so many non-tactical vehicles. Um, and uh, so as we move, you know, to, um, uh, off the internal combustion engine into to new forms of, of, of powering our vehicles. That's going to be an area where DOD can and should lead by example. And, and what you have to have there is, is either a requirement or an opportunity that makes it real. I, I recall we had a lot of requirements in the 90s to buy um, that generation's um, 
you know, lower emission vehicles, but there were no penalties for non-compliance. So often the services would report to me, well, we just didn't buy them this year because we spent the money on something else. And okay, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so, um, so you have to have, you have to look at all sides and how, how, to, how to incentivize that, um, that type of purchase. I think, you know, I think there's um, also a really important um, sort of people moment as well here. You know, I work with a lot of installation energy managers and installation planners. And one of the things that they, um, so these are folks, uh, you know, at the base level who are, you know, both challenged from the standpoint of they have an installation chain of command, often several layers of bureaucracy to reach somebody, a decision maker on their base. They also have a functional chain of command um, within their respective service, who is um, but it is sort of designed to help them um, accomplish their objectives and goals and, and achieve the policies that DoD has set out. But often, I think um, you know it is creates more challenges uh, than opportunities. And I think one of the things that we could be doing is really revitalizing and investing in our installations. I mean, I, I certainly agree that we have too many installations and that um, we have excess infrastructure. But a lot of that infrastructure is incredibly decrepit and in terrible shape. And so, you know, we should be um, identifying and prioritizing investments in that infrastructure, even just to bring it to, to modern day standards, to 2010 and 2012 standards, much less 2020 standards, or much less, you know, getting us to the point where we're prepared for uh, a real clean energy transition and climate future. And so um, those installations have been chronically underinvested in um, and, and, and purposely underinvested in. And um, looking at their, uh, the sort of near term, real world budgetary opportunities in front of us, I think that's one of the best ones because, and they have to do it in a way that lays a foundation for the kinds of advanced energy and infrastructure systems that we're going to need for tomorrow's military and tomorrow's military base. So, so I think that's a really good point. And just so everybody has a couple of statistics out there so they understand the scope of the problem, DOD has about a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure. Um, there is a maintenance backlog at those bases that exceeds a hundred billion dollars. So there is there are HVAC systems that don't work, roofs that haven't been fixed. I am not joking. These these places exist. And so the, the challenge is how do you catch up? Yeah, because all of the places that are in disrepair or that are relatively old uh, hemorrhage energy. And so that's a challenge we have. BRAC is a, a, a convenient solution if we can do it. It's a good government solution. But the challenge we have with BRAC is that it takes six years and then you start saving about $2 billion a year. And that is not equivalent to the scope of the problem that we're facing. There's a much bigger problem. I will add that the uh, Biden, uh, the incoming or the Biden plans, the incoming Biden administration, there have been promises made to identify the most vulnerable, the biggest vulnerabilities at those bases and to invest in resiliency. I think it is reasonable to expect a significant uptick in resiliency spending at DOD and in other federal agencies. Um, and so uh, when you spend a significant amount of money, there's going to be an opportunity to change the way you do business. Um, and, and to change the rules on what resilience means and so on and so forth. So I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space in particular and targeted investments in the energy and installation space that, that we may very well see. Um, so um, I have gotten sort of to the end of my list of questions, but we're getting new ones in. Um, and, and I know that folks have asked questions in the chat and so on and so forth. Um, we are at, uh, 3.37, we've advertised to four. Well, I think there's a desire by the panelists to stick around. Well, let's do a couple more questions here and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask folks to close. Um, the, the, uh, under the new administration, um, uh, I'm, I'm reading the last question in the chat. So y'all, it's always a good thing to, to, to be the last one in talking. Uh, under a new administration that understands climate security, how willing would DOD be to move forward on climate and speak about its importance? So how, so do we think that DOD is prepared to be a climate advocate? Uh, do we expect the secretary, the undersecretaries and so on and so forth to be able to, to uh, be forward leaning on this issue? Uh, does anybody have any thoughts on that? 
Oh, I, I definitely think it's going to lean in based on the military mission. Uh, you know, from the top and, and uh, you know, it should be the tone obviously should be set by the Secretary of Defense, but there are many other leaders, the service secretaries, the unders, combatant commanders, and, and as well as the, the installation and energy environment officials in the department, uh, all who have opportunities um, to lean forward on this because um, the Biden-Harris administration has, you know, transition has already said that this is among you know, their very top priorities in everything they've said, even when they announced the uh, Secretary of Defense nominee, they had a list of, I think, six, five or six priorities and climate change was right there. So I, I think it's now, it's going to flip from, you know, you can't talk about it to now you have to, you have to. And now, so the question is, what are you meaningfully going to say about it within um, what is the particular mission of the person that's speaking? And that's where I think uh, this expert community that we're talking to now can help um, fill that out, make that a reality. Um, and those of you who are going to be working in those various offices, you know, you've many of you've been working on these plans and policies and practices already for a number of years. So now is your opportunity to sort of dust it off and lift it up and say, here, okay, now give a major speech about it, write about it, you know, share it with your allies and partners when you go out to do your mill to mill and your other uh, engagements. And I think it's um, it's gonna be a whole new day and opportunities to work with our many um, foundation, private sector and, and other stakeholders out, outside of DOD. And John, John, I would add that uh, DOD is a fact-based uh, decision-making uh, objective organization effectively, culturally. So I'll cite uh, 2013 testimony by the then commander of the Pacific Command, uh, Admiral Sam Locklear, when asked at a Senate hearing what he viewed as the greatest threat in his theater, including uh, Asia and, uh, and, uh, sub and uh, South Asia, he said climate change, the biggest threat beyond Korea, beyond uh, you know, a, a, a growing Chinese Navy, et cetera, it was climate change. He was right then, seven years ago, and uh, his successors and, and all of the other combatant commanders since then have even bigger challenges of climate change in their areas of responsibility. So culturally, I think that, as Sherry said, DOD is going to lean in on this because they are very, very much science and fact-based. They deal with logic and they make decisions based on uh, their risk assessments. Yeah, I think it's a testament to a lot of the leadership that has been demonstrated within this community and by folks, by these panelists, um, that the that the leaders within DOD and the national security community um, have identified climate change as a risk and as something to be confronted. I, but I, I just think it's really important that we also think about the folks um, across this giant bureaucracy, right? It, you know, when we talk about DOD, uh, you know, DOD is not a monolith. It is comprised of millions of people um, who have different opinions about things. And I think one of the, you know, Sherry, you hit on this earlier, but one of the most important things we can do is inject um, information and education about climate change into service academies, into um, the services, um, postgraduate schooling, into just basic training for our service members. In addition, I, I, so to ensure that we have a climate aware and ready workforce, uh, the other thing I would say is um, we can focus, um, we, we really need to focus on tools that make climate action easy to do. You know, we have um, policy, and John, I think you actually wrote this policy um, that requires uh, us to consider climate change in installation development plans and other documents that are related to um, the future of our of individual installations within DOD. But if you ask the average climate or the, the average installation planner how to plan for the effects of climate change, you know, I they they don't have those tools easily available to understand what likely effects they're supposed to they're going to experience or whether a particular building on their base that they're planning for currently you know, it should be expected to, um, you know, have a particular set of vulnerabilities. You know, we need to make 
those um, extremely user-friendly and make those um, extremely accessible to our installation planning community and to our operational planning community in the future. I just want to jump in uh, uh, here. I, I do think it will be key uh, for leadership from the top to message this. I have to say uh, in my encounters with um, mid-career military officers, I have encountered some deep skepticism about climate change. Uh, I've also uh, a lack of um, uh, understanding how that affects the military mission. Uh, one story is, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but what what hill should I take? Who should I shoot? And that's not quite what it's at stake here. I will to tell you today, uh, to Mike's point, I think education is key. At the Naval War College right now, there is a class on climate change, but it's an elective. Um, and so uh, there, you can vote with your feet and just decide, I don't really want to know about this. Um, and I think that we have, just as we have in the civilian population, we have skepticism that I have encountered within the Department of Defense. And we're going to have to have strong leadership saying that this is the matter you need to care about. To Denny's point, I hope that you're fascinated with this now going forward to really turn around the mindset to understand that this isn't the type of uh, question about who you're gonna shoot or what hill to take. Uh, it's uh, about a broader range of considerations, but equally important to our global stability and the national security of the United States. Kate, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here and say on the education piece, what I've been seeing, which is really interesting, is, is to Alice's point at those senior and middle management positions that, that people sort of have never had to deal with climate change, have never had to learn about it. It's been totally siloed away from, from anything that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. But on the other hand, up and coming generations of people who want to go into security, who want to go into foreign affairs, who are either in, in military academies now or just emerging from them are desperate for education on this topic, right? They really want to consume everything they can about how it will, uh, frankly, uh, uh, affect their careers for the entirety of, of their jobs in national security. So I think um, what we're seeing in a way is a little bit of a generation gap where people like Sherry and Alice and, and Denny are few and far between who've really worked deeply on this issue uh, for a long time. But luckily the generation coming up has this uh, redefined conception of what security means and climate is front and center in that. So I think finding those people and elevating them will be really important. Um, and those people equipping themselves with the skills that they need as, as we've heard will be um, uh, something that can be hopefully transformative of each agency uh, on the way up. So, so as we uh, wind down on our time, I want to I want to stay on this issue of leadership and, and, and for just a, a minute more. Um, so, President-elect Biden has nominated General Austin. He spent a lot of time in CENTCOM. Um, what kinds of impressions? I don't have a lot of quotes from General Austin right now on climate and security. Um, that doesn't mean he doesn't care about it. What kind of an impression would being a commander in CENTCOM have made? Uh, to him on what the issues of, of climate and security. Does anybody want to comment on on what uh, kinds of things might have made an impression from that perspective? Oh, <laughs> I guess uh, that I was the wrong question. <laughs> he certainly, um, you know, having been in war fighting uh, commands, he certainly understands um, the energy supply chain and logistics of energy and how that affects our forces at the tactical edge and um, forward deployed. So um, he's undoubtedly had that direct experience. And I think that will give him a realistic sense of what, you know, what it means um, uh, to be able to better power our forces in a way that both reduces their carbon footprint, but also makes them lighter and more agile. Uh, and reduces supply chain risk, which is is all going to all going to come together now as we move to meet these ambitious um, net zero goals for the future, as well as retool our our military forces to fit 21st century combat threat environment. Um, at the same time, I think you know some of what this community has the opportunity to share with him in broad ways is the broader sort of 
beyond the CENCOM uh, AOR, which has its own particularities, but you know, so many of us on this call or you in the audience are all familiar with what's happening out in PACOM in the Arctic and South, er, everywhere. Um, and those particular dynamics, migration, sea level rise, um, changing geopolitics of, of competition are also, are also fundamental. And I think that climate security as a driver of in that realm is going to be important for him to be able to uh, articulate um, and address. And I, I noticed that many on this call, including our friends at the Naval War College, are actively working to educate um, the next gen leaders on that. Thanks. I, I think we're, we're getting close to the end. So what I'd like to do is ask each of you to take a couple of minutes to sort of give your closing thoughts. But in those closing thoughts, uh, can we get um, one recommendation for uh, something that should be uh, top priority for the new administration in the, whether it's day one or in the first month or in the first hundred days, like something that they need to do right at the outset. Um, but uh, but broadly, you know, your your closing thoughts. I'm going to do it in reverse order this time. So, uh, Mike. Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't think it'll surprise you uh, who have listened for the last hour and a half um, that really my focus is on um, creating a clean energy agenda for the Department of, of Defense that really supports military capabilities and resilience and flexibility, um, but also contributes to confronting climate change, both from a um, mitigation and adaptation standpoint. Um, there have been a lot of initiatives and um, work done to uh, make our, to, to implement clean energy as a tool and as a weapon for the Department of Defense and our military forces. Um, but there's an opportunity in front of us really with the, again, the aggressive commitments of the Biden plan and the incoming administration um, to catalyze and really um, sort of integrate and unify those around a singular purpose. And um, a good program like that could not only strengthen our military's capabilities and resilience, could not only um, put us in a better position from a strategic competition standpoint, we are today in a strategic competition with other nations who are aggressively pursuing clean energy and inventing the clean energy technologies that will transform our economy. Um, and we can make those here or we can import those from other places, um, but also is gonna be an important driver of jobs and economic recovery um, post pandemic. So if I would, it, one specific recommendation is um, we uh, could look at a new DOD Office of Energy Innovation um, that would both um, work to unify and integrate the efforts uh, within the Department of Defense and across the military services but also uh, look at the interagency, coordinate with the Department of Energy um, and Department of Homeland Security and their investments, coordinate with the private sector. So uh, something, a, a, a strong senior level leadership position dedicated to clean energy within DOD. Danny? The 9-11 Commission uh, cited uh, a lack or failure of imagination as one of the key uh, factors behind uh, our unexpected unpreparedness for 9-11. Here's another failure of imagination related to pandemics. And today we are losing more American lives every single day than we did on 9-11 on average. It's unbelievable. We are approaching loss of life of, of World War II scale. So lack of imagination should not be the reason we suffer tremendous losses of our quality of life, our national security, our net economic security because of climate change. We need to, we need to remember the lessons of the, of, of the past. Two recommendations on day one. Day one, uh, since it's uh, ahead of us on the, uh, in the global time zones, uh, I'd call Europe and let them know we're back in Paris. And uh, that, that'd be one. Uh, and the second thing, I would uh, cancel or override or in, in some legal way, uh, take every adverse Trump administration 
energy and environmental executive order and throw it in the, in the trash can and replace it with something that's positive. Thanks. All right, Alice. Um, I would have uh, two things. Uh, first, don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, there was a lot that was done over, the, over during the Obama administration that was rescinded. We can bring that back right away. I think we could spend a lot of time, just as we did during the Obama administration, wordsmithing that, trying to make it perfect. I wouldn't do it. I just take that, take that as a win, chalk it up, and then figure out what you're going to do uh, going forward. Um, the second thing I would do, and this is just to have a level setting, uh, I would bring in, uh, do a scenario uh, and bring in uh, the leaders and say, okay, I want you to plan against this 2030, 2050, whatever scenario is, what do you need to have your department do? And what do we need by the time we finish here to have set in place to keep us all safe going forward and require them to plan against a certain scenario so that there's no more of the second guessing. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. Uh, no, we're all planning to this. Uh, and DOD is great at scenario planning and exercises. So let's just start from the get go. And that's what we're going to make sure that we are safe going forward. Sherry. Okay, um, all, all great suggestions and uh, recommendations. I, I hope we can uh, do them all. Uh, and so uh, particularly that, that Clean Energy Innovation Transition Fund um, and, and, and the other efforts and the scenarios. So uh, reflecting, I think, on what looks like the, um, uh, how this administration wants to elevate uh, climate by naming an international climate czar in John Kerry. And it looks like they're about to name a white, another White House domestic climate czar. Um, I think in the national security community, in the Defense Department in particular, and, and probably there's an equivalent also in the Intel community, um, we need not only to restore the positions um, that have been downgraded um, in level and staff across the services in OSD. And I, I do note that the, the recent NDAA did, did put the Assistant Secretary of Defense position uh, back in place, which is at least the start for, for um, installations and in environment and, and energy. But it needs to be really threaded in from the very top. So, I mean, there could be, there is room to have a uh, a DOD, a DOD type of climate, czar is probably not the right word, but somebody who's working for the secretary directly is gonna run, uh, gonna make sure that this is threaded throughout, um, not just the installations, energy and, and environment realm as constituted currently in DOD, but throughout strategy, um, in personnel policy, um, in all realms of mill-to-mill -mill international engagements um, and that the budgets and the funding actually reflect the priorities of the department and the administration. And I think you could do the equivalent um, in other agencies, at least as a way to get things started uh, so that you would have this, the priority elevated and then they'd be reporting to their counterparts at the White House uh, in all those meetings that are going to go beyond, hopefully meaningful meetings, Alice, that go beyond what the secretary is going to go to, but go to actually implementing this agenda uh, across the interagency in a, in a meaningful way, both at a, a department level and then also when you get down to regional strategies um, that are going to be so fundamental. And then I think also the second point is, is to really address the personnel question. So many important and key people have retired, either retired um, and then their positions haven't been backfilled at the uh, career level. And then a lot of the political appointments that existed when, when all of us served don't exist anymore. So we've got to restore a lot of that. We've got to put our uh, prior personnel is the priority. Thanks. All right, Kate, do you wanna uh, add a couple thoughts? and then I'll take it home. Well, I think that, that pretty much sums up anything one could do on day one, let alone on, on all issues that will be uh, sort of on the desk of the, the incoming administration. But I think what, what this panel has really hit home is that there's a lot of good work already to build on. 
Uh, this isn't something where it's a, a clean slate. And in fact, I think that's something we at Center for Common Security remark on all the time, particularly because of Congress, there has actually been good progress on the climate security slate of issues in the past four years, while there hasn't been on other uh, larger climate issues. So it's a space where I think that the incoming administration should look at what already exists, look at past executive orders that people like Alice have put together, maybe quickly uh, reapprove some that have been uh, uh, tanked and trashed uh, in the meantime, but also listen to the people currently in these buildings about what they've been seeing and tracking and, and uh, what they are, are working on and empower them to finally do uh, what they want to do and, and see progress on these issues. And hopefully it will be one of those moments where the interagency process actually actually can be be made to work in a way that that we know that it needs to to address this issue because it's not something that that is a only domestic problem or only international problem it's not something that's only a defense problem it, it, we we need state department and usaid as well as uh, the the scientific agencies and intelligence community actually discussing and talking to each other on a, a cohesive strategy on this so hopefully uh, all of these ideas will come together and be able to be advanced uh, very quickly by the administration I just wanna thank uh, all of our panelists and all the attendees for sticking with us. Um, I will say this, I'll leave you with this last thought. Four years is a very short amount of time for an administration. They're the first budget that they get to develop all by themselves won't get passed and enacted for two years. Uh, personnel that they need in order to be able to do all these things won't be nom through the nominations and confirmation process for a year. There are gonna be a lot of things that they need to do and they need to do quickly and they need to get moving out. And I will uh, once again recommend our Climate Security Plan for America as somebody who's done all the work for them for at least the starting point uh, that they can use to get themselves a jump start on all of this. Thank you all, uh, good luck to the new administration and uh, we look forward to seeing them demonstrate leadership and make climate change a core national security priority. Thank you. Thank you all, great to be with you. Everyone. Thanks, everybody.